Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see everybody. We I just hit record, so we're going to record this session if if you miss a piece or if anybody that you know um, afterwards might uh, might find it useful. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Salento. I am the Community Development and Communications Manager here at Sullivan 180. Um, until this last year, I worked at Sullivan Renaissance, which some of you may be familiar with, but as of January 1st of, of this past year of 2023, we joined forces with Sullivan 180 to create one really robust nonprofit focused on health and community development and youth, the next generation and prevention efforts are central to everything that we do. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us this evening for being here so I can speak about um, something I'm really particularly passionate about, which is conservation of, of open space and planning effective, meaningful, usable green spaces. Um, the, the AICP after my name stands for American Institute of Certified Planners. So I am a planner by trade, um, but being at Sullivan 180 has exposed me to the, the intersections of planning and community health, which, which is really cool. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So those kind of intersections and how you can address those outcomes in your own community through planning measures. So I'm going to just get started with a little background. I do see some familiar faces and names, but also some people who may be new to, to Sullivan 180. And for those of you who are new here, I'll start with Sullivan Renaissance, which was founded in, in 2000 um, by Sandra Gary, which was kind of the original uh, nonprofit of, of our two nonprofits um, to fulfill her mission of making Sullivan County a beautiful, vibrant, healthy place to live. Uh, what started as small grants um, for community groups to plant gardens and flowers grew to three really robust grant programs with a variety of grants to fund different projects from, from $500 to $350,000. Um, plus, we have an excellent volunteer and intern program, horticultural and technical assistance, and, and more. Uh, and then Sullivan 180 was founded uh, as a partner organization in 2016 with the mission to turn around the health of Sullivan County, uh, 180 degrees, as we are um, number 60 of 62 in the Robert Wood Johnson County Health Rankings, which I'll get to shortly. Um, I do want to recognize my team members that are on the call. Um, Kelly Thelman is our marketing manager. Uh, so she's here. Hi, Kelly. And Nicole Blaze is our prevention coordinator. She's also on the call. Um, we, you know, these ladies and, and the rest of our team uh, were, were resources for you for the community. Um, so please engage with us after tonight um, and, and whatever we can do to help, we will. So as I mentioned, as of January 1st of this year, we are all Sullivan 180, and we have a renewed mission and a refreshed logo, which I'd like to introduce you to as it relates to what we're discussing tonight. So our mission is um, that we are dedicated to building a healthy community through people, places, and policy with an intentional focus on prevention and empowering a healthier generation. Um, so what does that mean? We we kind of take a really holistic and communal approach to health and community and kind of getting everybody involved in our mission and getting community support and getting buy-in from all levels of the community, including planning and zoning board members and, and municipal officials. Uh, our logo is a slight refresh from the old turtle, um, but the foundation of it is that the turtle represents slow and steady, as well as it has an incredibly long lifespan. Uh, the kind of change that we're looking to impact happens very slowly. People are not getting healthy overnight. We're not changing the health of our county overnight. Um, the kind of change that we're looking to impact happens very slowly. Um, and when it comes to open space planning and conservation, this is also slow, slow change in movement. Um, great spaces are not built overnight. Uh, forests don't grow overnight. It's very slow and steady. And weaving thoughtful planning into these processes is, is so important to us. So let's talk about health. 
Um, I'm going to start a little more macro and then focus in on Sullivan County. So county health rankings are a system developed by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. Um, they have developed this matrix that you see here to measure and quantify health, and they do that at the county level. So they look at all states, all counties, but they do it at the county level. So, so let's take a look at this matrix. Um, you have four main pieces of the puzzle, which make up health factors. Um, you have health behaviors. These are really the choices that we make as individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. Are we gonna smoke? Are we going to exercise? Are we going to um, you know, use alcohol and other drugs? So those are health behaviors and those are about 30% of our, of our health outcome, uh, of the factors of our health. Then we have clinical care. This is access to care, access to quality care. So do we have, you know, is there an emergency room nearby? Do I have doctors in my community that I'm able to see? Uh, and then we have social and economic factors, which are the biggest, that's 40%. So this is your education, your employment, your income. Those things are going to affect um, all of those socioeconomic factors will impact your access to quality health care. And also, um, you know, your choices, your um you know, your health overall. Um, and then we have physical environment. This is air and water quality, housing, transit, main streets, um, economic opportunities uh, on, on main streets. So together, all of these things influence health outcomes, which are longevity or length of life and quality of life. I want to hop back down for a minute to the physical environment. Um, it, it's 10% of all of these health factors, but um, which could seem small at first, but physical environment can really shape the remaining three factors. Um, and physical environment is where municipalities and planning and zoning boards in general come in and have the most power to impact change. So do you have parks? Do you have community that, that looks nice, that makes people feel welcome, connected? Um, do you have trees and forests to improve air quality? Do you have protections in place for these uh, forests and for water quality? Um, do you, you know, all of all of those factors. Now, I know all of our Sullivan County municipalities do and have a lot of these things to varying degrees. So, you know, we're all doing great work, um, but there's always more more work to be done. So let's focus in on our home county a little bit more, keep going down into the specifics. So the health rankings were introduced in 2010. And since then, we have only maintained one better than the last county, the Bronx. Um, and we are, as of this past year, we are number 60. So we have gone up one. Um, and I, I do want to point out that although we need to improve this greatly, this is out of all the counties in just New York State. Um, New York, in comparison to others in the U.S., is number 10 in the country in health outcomes. So if you look at the context of the entire country, we are doing okay comparatively, but within New York State, we really need to, to improve our numbers and our, our ranking. So we do have some really alarming statistics and circumstances here that in Sullivan County, which will hopefully encourage you to join us in the work that we're doing to improve these numbers. So when you think back to um, the county health rankings matrix, socioeconomic factors made up 40% of, of that measure. Health is disproportionately impacted by poverty. And if you are living below or around the poverty line, your access to health care, housing, and other services will, will directly impact your health. In Sullivan County, 17.5% of people are living below or at the poverty line. And in addition to that, there are so many people living just above that line. And just some, some quick statistics of things that we at Sullivan 180 think about a lot. Um, some of the more alarming statistics are that Sullivan County has the highest rate of death by suicide in the entire Hudson Valley. Um, depending on the school district, childhood obesity ranges between 29 and 40 percent across Sullivan County. That's one in three children in Sullivan County. Um, 53 percent of third graders, over half of third graders in all of Sullivan County have untreated cavities. These are really alarming statistics um, and they're things that, that drive us to do the work that we do every day. 
So another statistic um, that I really want to draw your attention to is regarding leisure time physical activity. This includes exercise, walking, hiking, um, swimming, fishing, really anything that you might do in your spare time that's active, a lot of times happens outside. Um, so Sullivan County has the lowest percentage of adults participating in leisure time physical activity in the Hudson Valley. Um, while other communities, all of the other um, counties in the Hudson Valley saw these numbers kind of grow or fluctuate, Sullivan County saw a consistent decrease um, from the study period, which was 2013 to 2018. We are the only one that steadily decreases in that number. And I can't help but think about how sad it is when you compare it to the environment that we live in. We have the Catskill Mountains, the Delaware River, um, the Never Sink River. We have some of the greatest natural and recreational assets in, in the state and maybe even the country. And so the amount of people who are interacting with these spaces in a healthy physical way, um, the numbers just aren't there. And that's, that's really disappointing. So what does this have to do with open space and parks and green space and all of it? Um, it has lots to do with it. So access to parks, nature, green and blue space, blue space I'll get to, um, have direct benefits to human and community health. I'll be focusing on human health outcomes in a minute, but first I just wanna kind of discuss some broad benefits of, of preserving open and, and natural space. So it improves air quality. The more trees you have, the more carbon capture you have. So trees are soaking up carbon dioxide that would otherwise be kind of floating around in the atmosphere. Um, and so the more trees and forests and natural space that you have, the more carbon capture that you're going to have, the better air quality you'll have in your community. It reduces noise. So this one's really simple. If you live next to a forest or a park, um, it's gonna be a lot quieter than living next to a highway. Uh, it enhances biodiversity, provides you know, really critical habitats for both endangered species and species that we, that we benefit from and that keep our environment healthy. Uh, it moderates temperatures, provides shade during hot weather, um, or can provide kind of um, a barrier from high winds and cold weather. Uh, and it also provides a place for social interaction and civic engagement. Um, civic engagement is something that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is actually looking at really closely over the next, you know, this past year and over the next couple of years, and how it, how social interaction and civic engagement impact one's individual health. Um, and from their initial findings, being involved in your community um, positively benefits your health. There's a direct correlation. Those who are involved in, um, you know, civic volunteer organizations, uh, community groups, all, you know, planning and zoning boards, I'm sure, you know, that civic engagement, those who are more connected in their communities are in general showing better health outcomes. So I want to turn more now to some specific human health benefits. Um, I do want to point out this chart has on it, you'll see um, living, working, or being educated in or near green or blue spaces. What's a blue space? You might have guessed it already, but we don't hear that term as often. Um, Sullivan County has an immense amount of blue space. This is natural water bodies. We have the Delaware River. We have the Never Sink River the reservoirs, so many lakes, ponds, streams. We have so much access to blue space here um, in addition to the valuable green space that we have. So um, open space, green space, blue space, all of it, nature um, really provides a, a crucial space for social interaction. Um, it also provides a space for relaxation, meditation and a reduction in the prevalence of chronic diseases. So those who regularly interact with a park or public space in a, in a healthy physical way have a, a reduced prevalence um, of chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, um, et cetera. Uh, additionally, you'll see a reduction in obesity to those who regularly recreate in uh, parks and open spaces, improved mental health. Uh, parks and green spaces provide a number of really important mental health benefits. So people who spend more time in nature enjoy enhanced cognitive function, uh, reduce stress. They're also less likely to have um, anxiety disorders, depression, 
um, other mental health issues, and in general, studies have shown report higher levels of happiness and well-being. Um, additionally, you have improved maternal and fetal health outcomes. This is, you know, really the healthier the mother, um, the healthier that the baby will be. So really starting them off from day one um, with, with a good chance of, of, of good health outcomes. And then physical exercise and heart health. This is, this is a no-brainer. Um, I do want to share the physical activity guidelines for Americans state that to attain the most health benefits from physical activity, adults need at least 150 to 300 minutes each week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. That's a, that's a lot of time. And I don't, and, and in general, us in Sullivan County, as, as we showed about the leisure time activity and, and other activity, we're not reaching that benchmark. Um, so adults in general need it also need at least two days of muscle strengthening activities each week, um, such as like lifting weights or um, doing push-ups. And nearly 80% of adults do not meet these guidelines for both aerobic and muscle strengthening activities um, in Sullivan County. And I also, I don't usually like reading a quote off of a slide, but there's no way for me to paraphrase this. And I really, I like how this quote sums it up. Um, because of the benefits provided by parks and green spaces are typically free and publicly accessible, they represent a cost-effective alternative and or supplement to conventional health promotion strategies. These spaces are especially important for physical health and they create environments that support active lifestyles and improve access to exercise opportunities. Um, I really wanna draw attention to um, the free and publicly accessible piece. Um, we discussed poverty a few slides ago and its impact on health. I'm not saying that parks or access to parks will magically replace good health insurance, but only good can come out of, of everyone being able to interact with green space in their communities. So in addition to kind of general health benefits that we discussed, there are two groups of people that are uh, disproportionately positively impacted um, by access to the outdoors, uh, and that's our young people and our aging populations. So for young people, um, social interaction is really important for early brain development. Um, parks and playgrounds encourage participation in social activities. <laughs> Us contributing to um, social well-being and social kind of cohesion. COVID made this really difficult. We were seeing a lot more social anxieties and social difficulties with our youngsters, but parks and public spaces kind of provide a healthy alternative um, during that time and in general. Uh, again, young people are seeing a reduction in obesity, improve memory and cognition, reduce stress, um, fine motor skills. There are studies that show that nature-based education and play can help children develop their fine motor skills earlier in life. And additionally, studies show that children with relatively low exposure to green space are more likely to have poor eyesight, suffer from obesity, and be exposed to higher amounts of stress. Um, so really, one of the best things we can do for our young people is provide them with uh, access to the outdoors. Additionally, the elderly also experience a great deal of health benefits from access to nature, um, increased physical activity, better cardiovascular outcomes, uh, lower risk of depression. There was, in, in my research, I found a 2018 study that was done that showed the elderly people who could just see a blue space or a water body from their home um, had or from their community had a, had lower risks for depression and lower risk factors for for depression and anxiety. Um, again, social isolation and intergenerational interactions. These are really important. Um, creating bridging the gap between our elderly populations and our young populations. Parks are a great space um, for them to interact uh, in a healthy in a healthy setting. Um, and when it comes to social isolation, accessible green space really offers a place for social interactions, which can counter the risks of social interaction or of social um, isolation among the elderly. So again, COVID was really isolating, but outside provided a safer venue for meetings, for social gatherings, et cetera. So we've talked about 
um, the health outcomes, but everything that we've been discussing kind of hinges on the fact that people have the ability to access a park or a green space or, or a natural setting. Um, we live in a rural area, so this can present unique challenges uh, when it comes to, to accessing parks uh, specifically um, that people in cities may not experience. So when we're planning for parks and public spaces, we need to consider um, a couple things. These are just a few ideas, but consider bicycle routes or demarcating bike paths to get to those spaces. Um, checking existing uh, public transportation routes. How might you partner with an organization to provide transportation from, um, from certain developments or certain areas to parks and public space? Um, off-road parking, if you're going to have a space, a park, you definitely need safe off-road parking um, for those who do travel by car, especially if it's a trailhead. Um, and then sidewalks or walking paths if the area is appropriate. If you are in a more, you know, kind of urban center, Liberty, Monticello, um, some, of our, some of our urban centers, sidewalks and kind of demarcated walking paths make a lot of sense to help people find their way um, or access a park safely. And I want to mention, um, we do a lot of work with Cornell, um, Sullivan County Cornell Cooperative Extension, and Wanda Cruz at CCE has a great amount of resources for safe routes to parks. That's really her specialty. Um, so we do have resources in the county to help accomplish these goals. And you don't have to invest millions of dollars into a place to make it an accessible green space. It's all about thoughtful planning and activation. So um, events that expose people to your natural assets are so important to introduce people to them in a creative and engaging way and encourage them to go back. Um, you know, you could have, I, I know um, the town of Thompson, uh, for example, does a really great job of hosting community, free community events at their public parks to get people to go there. They do fishing demonstrations. They have, you know, craft nights or uh, different, you know, um, different workshops and things. You can have guided trail walks all seasons. You can do a, a you know, a snowshoe event. Um, there are so many ways to really activate these places and get people exposed to them. So I wanna talk about some key kind of takeaways and strategies that, um, that are relevant really to planning and zoning board members, as well as municipal officials. Um, these are really where we have kind of the, the teeth um, in, in what we do. So first and foremost would be updating your comprehensive plan. Um, a, municipal, a, a municipality's comp plan is the basis for all kind of planning, zoning, development activities. It's so important to keep this document up to date because it provides the justification um, for everything that you do and implement as a municipality. So when you're creating those comp plans or updating them, make sure that you're prioritizing green space, parks, trails, um, and clearly articulate in your plans the benefits of these amenities in terms of health, community cohesion, um, environmental protection. I know that, uh, you know, accessing grant funding for projects is a huge piece of, of what municipalities do to help fund parks and other initiatives. And being able to articulate positive public health outcomes in, in kind of a, a post-COVID world, there is so much funding available for improving community health that you can access if you're willing to kind of argue what you're doing in a park or public space as it relates to improving community health. So it's, you know, beautification and, and, you know, creating a nice public space are wonderful things, but being able to argue that community health benefit um, is, is a really kind of key component of that when you're, when you're looking in, into funding. Um, incorporating kind of green requirements into your zoning code. So consider integrating provisions into your zoning code that mandate a certain percentage of land and new developments be dedicated to green space, parks, trails. Several several towns in, in Sullivan County already do this, um, but it's worth taking a look to see if yours does. See, is it working? Um, how much are you requiring? Are you, you know, what, where, where is that sweet spot of, um, of requiring that protection and not discouraging um, new, new development? 
consider offering incentives such as fee reduction or expedited processing for developers who do kind of exceed the minimum requirements for a green space. If you're going to have someone coming in proposing um, a big development, but they want to incorporate a ton of green space and maybe some of it's publicly accessible, um, even if it's not, that access for those residents is really key. Um, so consider incentives like that in, in your municipal planning. Engage with the community. Um, fostering community involvement through workshops, public hearings, surveys, the, the like, um, to gather input on what your community needs. Of course, this is often a really big part of the comp planning process, um, but it's at any time, it's important to gather community input. What, what are residents thinking? What, what kind of needs do they have? What, um, what projects do they see could benefit the community or what feedback do they have on your existing parks and trails? Um, and take, take that feedback into account and, and work with it and see how you can implement um, implement planning to, uh, to address those concerns. Encourage community members to participate in, in the planning process. And then also you can in turn um, have education around why it's, why it's important and, and also the, um, the abilities and the limits of planning and zoning boards and, and municipal boards, because sometimes there, there are some. So having those conversations um, are, are really important. Collaborating with stakeholders. This is where, where organizations like Sullivan 180 come in. Um, establish partnerships with your schools, with local nonprofits, healthcare providers to enhance accessibility and usability of green spaces. Um, we at Sullivan 180 are, we are working in every single school building in Sullivan County and every school district, working on projects that create healthy spaces within the schools and how how can the schools and the municipalities partner, interact to provide um, really great shared public spaces as well as is something really great. You know, do you have a school that has a track that could be publicly accessible at certain times to um, have people from the community use it? You know, what kind of partnerships can you do? Are there um, healthcare providers that you want to entice to bring into your community to provide better services to your residents um, and having those conversations. So there's, you know, we, none of us do this work in a silo. And so it's really important to be having these conversations with each other about the, the work that we want to do in the spaces that we want to create. And again, as we, as we kind of discussed earlier, prioritize connectivity and active transportation. So support the development of pedestrian and bike friendly infrastructure like sidewalks, bike lanes, trails. Um, these things encourage physical activity and reduce reliance on motorized transportation. Of course, we're a very four season community here in Sullivan County, and we have some also some steep mountainous grades. So, you know, bike infrastructure, walking infrastructure is not always um, feasible, but when it is, when you think about places or networks like the ONW Rail Trail, how are you capitalizing on that in your community to create better access to um, to parks and public spaces. I would say one really great example of a municipality that um, that prioritizes or that emphasizes their connectivity would be in the village of Woodridge. You have the rail trail that goes through the whole village and it connects to Krieger Park. It connects to Mountaindale eventually down, down the way. It connects to the main street. So think about how if you have a trail in your community, how it could enhance connectivity between assets in your community. Um, consider environmental impact. So advocate for the preservation of natural habitats and sensitive ecosystems in your community when you're planning for parks, public spaces, or, or private development. Um, the more biodiversity we have in our, in our environment, the better that our, uh, that our physical environment will be. And then of course, it's, it's a domino effect and our health um, is directly impacted by our, by our physical environment. Um, encouraging social infrastructure. So developments that create social gathering spaces um, or public green spaces that encourage community interaction. This is really important um, as we discussed with both youth and the elderly specifically, social interaction is key, but it's really key with everybody. Like, like we said before, civic engagement 
is something that um, that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is looking into um, and how your interconnectedness in your community, your connections, your relationships that you're forming with your neighbors um, and other people that live in your community, you will have better health outcomes in general when you know your community, when you know the resources available to you, et cetera. So those are just some, some key takeaways. I did want to leave a little time for discussion, um, but first I just want to do some, some housekeeping. Um, so we will be posting this session to our YouTube so you can share it with others who, who might not have been able to make it um, or watch it again. Um, tomorrow I'll be sending certificates to those who indicated that they were on a planning or zoning board. Um, you are responsible for submitting it to your own board clerk for recording. Um, but I will send it directly to you as you register to that email address. Um, so I do want to open it up for a bit of discussion um, or questions, um, thoughts, concerns, um, things that you're that you're doing in your community that that you're particularly excited about or inspired by. Examples. Um, I'm I'm opening up the floor. No one wants to talk about any specific projects or, or parks or great assets in their community that they've helped implement or that their municipality has supported or that they've encouraged because of, you know, if you're on a planning or zoning board, is there a particular project that was influenced by your um, your involvement or your suggestions as a, as a planning or zoning board member? Or we can can call it an evening and you all can go enjoy dinner and and spend time with your families and think think about everything that we've talked about tonight. Um, we we are here as a resource at Sullivan 180. Um, we have a variety of programs. I kind of mentioned some of them in the in the beginning, but we do have an entire school based team. We have um, we have a beautification program. We have my community development and municipal programs, volunteers, interns, um, the fire department challenge. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Nicole on the call leads our prevention programming. So she works on on you know vaping cessation and vaping prevention. Um, we have all sorts of, of great programming that we can bring to your community, to your community group. We can also do, um, we can also come to your planning or zoning board or your municipal board. If you're doing a comp plan rewrite and you want a particular presentation on, on the county health outcomes or any kind of, any topic that, that we have team members that are experts in, uh, we're happy to come to your community come to your municipality or town hall and, and give you a presentation that's tailored for you. Um, I, I gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago or a couple months ago now to the Tustin Conservation Advisory Council. Um, and so they were working on, on an open space plan and I was able to present to them. Uh, but we're, we're always able and willing to, to come to your community. And, oh, and we have a comment from Sue Kosofsky. Thank you, Sue, for sharing. We have... Krieger Park and Woodridge where people can interact such as National Night Out. For those who don't live in Woodridge without transportation, it is difficult at times for them to attend. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. But that is Krieger Park is a great example. And I know Sullivan Renaissance in the village of Woodridge and now Sullivan 180 and the village have worked together over time to do a lot of projects there. Really great park. Um, Denise Frangipani in, uh, in Bethel. Um, Denise is also our, our CEO here at Sullivan 180. Um, we have the forest reserve in Smallwood in Bethel, which is in Smallwood. It has exercise stations and encourages people to explore the woods. Another great example of, of place activation. Um, you know, you have people walking through spaces regularly and maybe you provide an exercise station to get them to kind of think, oh, wait, I can do something different here um, is always a, a great way to activate a space um, and get people to think about it or interact with it in a different way. Um, but I thank everyone for being here tonight. Like I said, we are happy to continue this conversation with you, with your board, with other organizations in the community that you're involved with about our work here at Sullivan 180. We're all very passionate about it. 
um, and happy to share. And thank you for being here. And we'll feel free to contact us. My contact information is on the screen. Follow us on um, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, all those, all those social media channels to see what we're up to. And we hope to see you around the community. Thank you, everyone.